Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and with each other. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and I am so excited for this week's conversation. I'm ready to be a student. I am ready to be inspired and just engage in this topic of conflict mediation. Uh, And joining me in coming back to the show being gracious enough to come back to our show is Maxine Woods McMillan. So let me give a little bit of background. Um, Some of you may be familiar. She joined us last year when we were talking about um, all the firings and how they were happening terribly (laughs) in the workplace. And so she's come back. So let's let's review her bio so we can uh, be anchored in the great, great insights that she brings to us. All right. Throughout her career, T. Maxine Woods McMillan has been known as the great translator, finding ways to make parties with differing and at times competing interests understand the position of the other. And when that has not been successful, her talented advocacy skills has made her equally effective at getting the fact finder in dispute to see the position of her client. Maxine's practice focuses on employment law, business dispute resolution, and workplace equity and equality. She represents employees when their rights have been violated and is also a trusted advisor and trainer for employers and their staff to help prevent violation of those rights before it occurs. She is a compassionate yet formidable advocate in the areas of discrimination on the basis of race, sex, gender, pregnancy, religion, national origin, and age, as well as sexual or racial harassment and wrongful retaliatory termination. She also brings a niche understanding to the distinct dynamic created when workplace intersects with a family relationship or is part of a faith community and is particularly equipped to assist with legal advocacy in those areas. Welcome to the show, Maxine. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me back. I'm I'm so excited to be here. I am. I'm I'm so, so excited to jump into this. Now, before we get into it, what else would you like people to know about you? Oh, boy. Um, At this exact moment, uh, I'm being tortured. We're recording this. And, uh, you know, in the office when they say the rules about what you can't put in the microwave. Well, I'm a huge popcorn nut. (laughs) And so as part of my Valentine's Day present, um, my son made me a big thing, a big uh, thing of popcorn. And it's smelling right now. (laughs) So as much as I'm enjoying this time with you. I'm craving popcorn. (laughs) I mean, he can just bring in a little bowl and we can just edit out the crunches. I'm all about, you know, let's honor our human needs. Let's meet each other where we're at. I wish that I had the kind of restraint and decorum that I could just take (laughs) one kernel and, you know, very ladylike, munch it away. But, Mm. you know, usually... It's more like I'm devouring and, you know, a finger might get lost. So <laughs> let's just wait till the end. <laughs> okay, wait. So I have, I have so many questions. So any kind of popcorn or is there specific kinds? Like, oh, is it the okay. traditional butter? So is, like the is, more butter, the better? It has to be the traditional butter. Okay. I do not do microwave popcorn. That's sacrilege. So either it from the kettle or we actually have more than one um this is embarrassing but we actually have more than one popcorn maker machine in this house (laughs) (laughs) i Um, love it are um, they running at the same time like this is what i'm curious about like is it so you have a backup in case one breaks or you're like downstairs depending on where the craving hits me um yeah but that kind of once you say it out loud you realize you might have an issue if you have to have (laughs) an upstairs (laughs) and a downstairs popcorn machine (laughs) So maybe probably not what your listeners were like, okay, she's an attorney who (laughs) likes popcorn. It's probably not what they wanted to know. But at that exact moment, I just was like, did he have to make the popcorn like right Mm. when I was going on air? (laughs) I love it. I I love it so much because that's just a beautiful example of life and being present with and and meeting the moment. I, um, I, you know, I I just, I I don't do fake well anymore. I think it's like, you know, 
when I was younger, I would have never said that, but I don't know. I, I, I heard it so many years and I think it's true. There's something about mm. hitting that certain age. You know, once you become mm. a lady of a certain age that you just like, this is me. <laughs> and this is where I'm at. It's it's always yeah. like, don't ask me how I'm doing if you don't want the real answer. I have a terrible poker face, <laughs> right? And it's just like, oh, I'm <laughs> having digestive issues right now actually is where I'm, you know, or whatever the case is. Like there's not... Not wow. much off limits. To see this, but I love you. Um, but then, okay. And see, and but don't you feel closer to the person? Like once someone shares the digestive yeah. issues with you, and then because that's happened <laughs> to me, and I'm like, really, <laughs> girl, listen. And I've given them the pills that I take. You know, first of all, they feel better because they realize they're not the only one. Because I'm telling you, when you become a woman of a certain age all kinds yeah. of things it's like everyone leaves the everything at changes. the same time in your body mm, mm, and they're all mm, just like i love it oh yeah i'm on break all at the same time and so <laughs> you're taking all kinds of stuff and whatever and i'm you know i i can't tell you how many times it's been like oh really girl take this and then you they come back three days later and i'm near the new best friends because they're like yeah <laughs> Like it's too much information. I was like, well, for who? I'm I'm actually good with it. Uh, we're, we're all doing this thing together. It you know, I I I I really love how you said I don't do fake well. Um, I really love that because it, it's one, too much like, work. Yeah, and life's too it's short, too and short. and you you can tell. I mean, authenticity. Uh. Uh, just like is such an important part of of building relationships and having that connection of are you are you who you say you are or are there some walls up that I can't get past and I'm not sure right who you are so I just I I appreciate it that we started with that it's it's funny actually I don't actually have digestion issues but I do when I eat popcorn so I think the reason that came up was because I was having sense memory <laughs> of I love popcorn and my body doesn't <laughs> like I yeah I love it so much, but my body rejects it. And I'll give severely. you a secret for that when we get off too. Cause mm, I, had to I love it. We'll well. put it in the show notes for everyone else who's <laughs> listening. Who's like, I want to know her secrets. Okay. So let's, let's, let's get into our topic because there's so many okay. places that I want to explore with you. But first what I'm, where, where I want to start is just the beginning. What, what has been your journey to this work that you're doing and you're so passionate about and so skillful at? Gordon Gecko. So you remember Gordon Gecko? You remember the movie, right? And Gordon Gecko goes, "Greed is good," and mm. which seems kind of like antithetical, right? What are you talking about? Greed cannot be good because we are conditioned that if someone is greedy, that is obviously bad. Now, I am not saying that I believe greed is good. What I'm saying is I believe conflict is good, mm. right? Um, and I know when I say that, people usually kind of look at me like either she's weird or she's selling something. And it's neither, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But if we immediately see conflict as the bad to be avoided, then we don't, who develops strategies for the bad, right? Who looks ahead to the bad and who sees the bad as inevitable? Um, the only thing we put that category put in that category is death, right? We accept mm. that it's inevitable, but we don't really want to talk about it too much. Mm. Um, you know, how many people have really fun conversations about when I die? <laughs> you know, um, it's practical, it's wise, um, it's a good strategy, and just like you plan for the um, uh, inevitable. Um, I think you should also, uh, in death, I think you should also plan for conflict. Um, mm. I would love to say that I always thought that. I did not. <laughs> I came to this place because I avoided both intrapersonal con uh, conflict and interpersonal mm. conflict. So intrapersonal conflict is conflict within yourself internally. Um, and when you don't handle your intrapersonal conflict, it becomes increasingly hard uh, to deal with your interpersonal conflict, right? Um, but both should be expected and both should be strategized to handle. 
So that's kind mm-hmm. of like my evolution is one, not um, realizing that conflict is inevitable. Um, humans develop, uh, we socialize differently, we experience the world differently. Um, and, and so it should not be looked at as something to avoid at all costs. That is, it is inevitable that uh, just, just like we uh, should expect to have conflict with one another, uh, we're going to have conflict with ourselves. And, you know, earlier mm-hmm. we were just talking about uh, as we grow, as we change, as we age, our bodies change. When I, sometimes I call myself having a conversation, the T in my name, I have myself having a conversation with Tammy, right? Tammy was what everyone called me when I was a teenager in my early 20s. It's my first name. And when I think about who I was at 21, the 20, 21, 22 year old Tammy versus me now, I don't even know if I'm the same person. I mean, I guess we (laughs) both live in the same body, but I have changed so much you know, Mm -hmm. from when I was that person. Um, And if I were to say that I had to stay rigidly adhered to everything that that person thought, and I didn't wrestle with myself internally, then I would not be very well equipped to to, uh, wrestle with others. And I would not see that as uh, reflective of a necessity to end the entire relationship. Just like I didn't end the relationship with myself. I understood that Mm -hmm. I I evolved, I changed. Um, and the conflict was something that um, didn't mean that there was something wrong with me at either point, um, mm. that conflict can be a separate entity outside of the individual. Mm. I, I don't know that I've heard somebody articulate and focus on the intra conflict when talking about conflict. I'm, I'm pausing and reflecting because so, so much of the work when I think about things I've read or work that we're doing and, and the people, you know, we're following it, it. It's, it's always the interpersonal, not the intrapersonal. And that point you made is such a important one of if we cannot navigate our internal, like our conflict with ourselves, that intrapersonal, it's going to make it way harder. And boy, that's resonating. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I always say I'm a in progress reformed avoider of conflict. It's not I wish it was a I wish it was a switch that could just flip. Right? I wish that it could just happen. But, you know, speaking from my lived experience as a white Midwest woman, it's all about a level of perfection of of keeping a false sense of harmony of right and lived experience of how how I was raised was very much you either you avoided it out of fear or you avoided it because of anger right like there the the reasons were maybe different but the, but, the but I hadn't nice. thought about that that oh yeah I call it violent politeness mm-hmm. we're very violently polite mm-hmm yeah, that that just yeah. like we're going to keep things we're going to keep things calm and i hadn't i hadn't I hadn't made that connection of as and so here's as, the thing yeah keep here's going yeah here's the thing i love what you just said about we keep things calm because when we know that there is conflict and we don't develop a strategy and i'm really intentional about using the term develop a strategy mm. to deal with that mm. conflict it at the um with when the goal is to keep things calm, what you're actually doing is because you want to avoid an external war, you're just increasing the likelihood for internal wars. I mean, that's all you're doing. That's, yeah. It's it's not gonna go anywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Matter does not move and emotions are not going to dissipate, right? Because, you know, it's kind of like you remember when you were a kid and you would cover your eyes when something scared you? <laughs> put the blanket yeah. over your head and it's like the monster that I believe that can fly through the night and break through the walls and permeate the roof but darn when he gets to that cotton blanket he's just not gonna be able to get to me that's kind of like <laughs> as adults how we handle conflict right right it's like it's... you're making entire life decisions you're you're navigating your, in my case, you know, what I see, you're navigating your workplace entirely differently. You're reorganizing your calendar. You're redirecting resources. You're doing all of these things to avoid this person uh, or to avoid this issue, Um, you know, uh, and if you just keep avoiding it, 
it's just going to dissipate. <laughs> mm, mm. It's, right? you know, it's, I, yeah, I, that, <laughs> that point of when you avoid the external war <clears throat> just shifts to the internal war, right? And the, the resentment that builds up and the frustration or um, disappointment. I had a friend, I had a friend in high school who would always say, um, I'm always really flattered when somebody ignores me. And I was like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And he goes, because they're spending so much time and effort paying attention to where I'm at. And I was like, damn, that's really good. It's kind of a good perspective. Like it's a different perspective, <laughs> but um, the cost is there. Yeah, we, so let's, you know, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of the work that, that we do around it, but I want to hear from you and your perspective. Why is it so prevalent? Because, or let me be clear, why is it so prevalent in Western culture? Um, of of the conflict avoidance. I mean, and I know that there's layers to this, but I can't tell you how many times people be like, oh, we get along really great. Our relationship's really great. We never have disagreements. And I'm like, oh, that actually, that's a little bit of a red flag for me that we can't disagree and we aren't disagreeing or we aren't navigating it. And yeah, so just like what's what's been your experience of why why is it such a taboo thing? For so many. It's well, not everyone, but yeah, for listen, so many. I don't think it's necessarily bad if you have relationships in which you don't disagree. And mm. and again, this is kind of one of those things when you get to be a lady of a certain age. But I have plenty of relationships with with of, with people with whom I have no disagreements. Do you know why? Because mm. I'm not invested enough in the relationship for us to <laughs> warrant a disagreement. Like yeah, I have a great sure. relationship with my male woman. She's been my male yeah. woman for years. We see each other. We say hi. <laughs> you know, it's a real great surface level sure. relationship, you know. <laughs> For Mother's Day and Christmas holidays, I give her a little envelope. She brings my mail. If something's really big, she'll <laughs> ring the doorbell. I mean, we got a good thing going. It's really surface level, right? So not every relationship is one in which you're going to be vested enough for a sure. disagreement to even resonate, mm. for it to even mm. register. I mean, let's think about it. Like using that same example, if my male woman was upset with me and we had a disagreement, would I, how long would it take for me to notice? I mean, as long as she's dropping off the mail, I, I probably wouldn't notice until like, I don't know, Christmas and she doesn't say thank you for the envelope or something. I don't know. Um, so not every relationship, not every person that we interact with is even going to warrant uh, a disagreement. Mm. And so we have mm. to recognize that relationships really are tiered in our emotional hierarchical structure. Um, and the ones that... Um, you know, I have a saying, I have to respect you enough to be insulted by what you said. If mm. I, if you cannot compliment me, you do not have the credence or credibility to criticize me. And so I need that level of investment. I need that level of involvement uh, for you to impact my life and for me to care what you think, <laughs> right? So that's the first thing. Um, but to answer your, so that's the secondary part of your question. But to answer the primary part of your question, why is it so taboo? I think it's so taboo because we have been conditioned and socialized. And when I say we, I mean collectively in our society. And I know this is definitely how I kind of experienced and grew up. That if there's conflict, if there is, if you and I have a, an issue, it's because one of us did something wrong. <sighs> yeah. That someone is wrong that mm. someone is culpable, right? Um, because if there, if we have zero sum propositions that the right. presence of conflict means the presence of culpability on the part of one of the people involved in the conflict, and we live in a society that has trained us to win, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the Western patriarchal model, yeah. right? You gotta win. Yeah. And so if I win, you have to lose. It's the ad mm. linear adversarial nature of, of how we perceive and how we work through, um, how we define uh, a conflict. And so I think that's the first part is immediately part of that uh, calculus is, okay, who's wrong? Mm. Because if you're wrong, then I'm right and I win, right? And if we're both thinking that, then it's kind of like the tug of war over this really, really big pile of poop-filled water, 
<laughs> <laughs> and if I avoid it, then I avoid ever being wrong. But you right? don't avoid it. You just displace no, right. it. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. no, there is no such thing as avoiding conflict, right? Conflict mm. does not get mm. avoided. Conflict conflict doesn't get avoided. It gets replaced. And when I say mm. replaced, I don't mean it gets repositioned rather. Right? So either either you and I are going to have interpersonal conflict or I'm not going to address it. And that interpersonal conflict is just going to hang there, but the weight of it is going to internalize here or internalize there, or even worse, and this is where usually I get called in, it's going to start spewing out to everyone outside, right? So the periphery gets it and they're just getting splattered with it to, you know, to use my very crass analogy. And they're just going, <laughs> with why the poop is this water? hitting me in the face? What is going on? <laughs> the poop filled water. Why, why am I getting hit with this? <laughs> That's such a, that's such a, that's such a great point. I, um, mm -hmm. there are things you're going to say that I'm just going to sit here and go, mm -hmm, because I'm still like processing <laughs> it and reflecting on it. And <laughs> my brain can't catch up with, with where my mouth is. Uh, it's that, what a, what an important call out, because I think so often, right, that it's, t you know, I read I read somewhere this idea that, you know, the, the classic phrase of time heals all wounds. And, um, you know, and it doesn't. It doesn't. Right. But a good conversation can. Um, right. Having, you know, whether that's a conversation with ourselves, whether that's a conversation with some someone else. And, you know, the thing that's the thing that is has been interesting for me on my journey um, and again, like it's still it's still something I have to push against in my DNA. It's right. It's something that I have to uh, literally I feel like sometimes I'm in situations where I have to push out and say, you know, actually, I disagree with that or, you know, I have a different perspective. And the thing that I found is that in relationships where that is present, there's a sense of liberation of of being able to just like, oh no, I, I can I can share and I can exist and you can share and you can exist and we can have these conversations and and we and we know we'll be okay, right? That we can we can have these tough moments, we can disagree, we can navigate like, oh wow, that was actually really hurtful and have those conversations. There is so much more freedom that I feel in those relationships where we are able to step into the heat together, so to speak, compared to the ones, right? The very thing that I was like, oh, I'm afraid. So we're going to keep the peace. and We're going to keep things calm in this false sense of harmony because that will make things better. And now that I'm starting to get on the other side of it, I realize like, no, that's actually not better. And so your, your whole point about it just gets dis displaced or repositioned is very resonant for me right now. And so, Everything you said makes total sense. I love it. Um, in my work, most of the time, uh, well, I would say half of the time, it works really, so what you said works really well if we're on equal footing in terms of power structures and hierarchy, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. But it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have the same, it requires a different internal conversation and a different, um, uh, normalizing a different locus of normalization uh, when there are different levels, right? Because it's one thing to say, you know, we, we can both exist, right? When I'm not dependent on you for my livelihood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, we can, so I'm not disagreeing with you at all. And what I'm saying is we, got, we have to be mindful that conflict doesn't always come when people are, it, when people are in uh, equal positions. Uh, in terms yeah. of power structures, um, it, it's distinctly different when you can control my livelihood, when you controlled, you know, my money my, I might make, my career progression, uh, when that power dynamic is different, how do you still, um, uh, what's the conversation? How does the conversation change in terms of conflict? Yeah. And so, whereas whereas one requires an, an awareness, I think the next step of that when there's a power dynamic change or shift is a certain amount of courage, right? Mm -hmm. um, it does mm -hmm. require courage. Um, it requires courage and it requires strategizing. 
Mm. It requires courage to say to someone who, yes, does have the power to impact your livelihood, your, um, uh, your future, however you may perceive that, um, when that power dynamic is different, it requires a certain level of courage uh, to say, I am going to have this conversation despite what might be an unfavorable possibility. But you also have to strategize because, you know, again, you're, you're in a certain place in life. We have to be realistic. We can't just all just handle conflict, um, you know, in a way that doesn't take into to, uh, perspective, doesn't take into uh, consideration that everyone is not going to be where we are. Everyone mm-hmm. is not going to think the way that we think, and they may not be as evolved. And so mm-hmm. how am, if, if, if I know that's a possibility, how am I planning for that? Am I having the conversation, for example, am I confronting this conflict in a way that might exacerbate an already tenuous situation um, that might put me in a place where I might lose my job? <laughs> Right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now, you've just created another set of conflicts because now you have to, you know, figure out how you're going to navigate your life. You know, if you're, you know, personally, you might have to share that news with someone else that's going to impact someone else's life. Um, so, this is why, you know, at the top of the show, we talked about planning for conflict. Planning for conflict at times requires us to be kind of uh, practical, kind of, you yeah. know, really brass tacks about, okay. This is not just about how I feel, but taking it a step further and making sure that I I develop the the structures around my feelings to support my feelings. So being courageous Mm -hmm. enough to confront that internal feeling, those internal feelings, what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling it, and then being aware enough of it to validate like, okay, you know what, I'm I am. I'm not even angry. I passed angry about 20 minutes ago, two months ago, um, you know, three emails ago. I'm officially pissed now, Yeah, (laughs) you know, Um, and then and then feeling feeling justified enough like and I want to say this. Mm. It took me a long time. To accept in myself that it was okay for me to feel what I felt. Mm. period. It does not mean everyone's going to agree with what I feel. But it took a while for me, for Maxine, to accept, okay, I am going to quiet the external noise enough to be able to internally look at myself and name my feelings. That is a process that takes time and discipline. It takes time and discipline to interrogate your internal feelings and then name Mm. them and then accept them. You know, like I don't have to give 5,000 reasons why that's okay. This is what I feel, period. End of paragraph, no further, (laughs) that's it. You know, like Mm -hmm. no is a complete sentence. Yes is a complete sentence. This is how I feel, end of conversation new conversation. (laughs) Now, this is how I'm going to deal with it. And and when we give ourselves, as you said, that kind of liberty, that kind of freedom um, to be fully accepting of what we feel and treasure and value Mm. ourselves enough to say, this is what I feel. And, Mm. And so therefore, because I feel this, if that feeling is not positive, I love myself enough. I love the people around me enough or I value the work that I do in, in the context of, of how I do uh, this work. I love the people, I, 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 I value the work that I do in the environment I do it enough that I am going to um, pursue health for this mm. relationship, for this mm. dynamic. And, and that means that we might have to address something uh, that, is, that is conflict. Also, if you, name, if you name the feeling, then you get to name the conflict separate. Say more if about you name that. Name your feeling. Yeah. Then you get to name the conflict separately and you can separate them. Conflict mm. is its own entity. Mm. There's one, I'm I really I'm glad that you brought up about the power dynamics because that was something I wanted to explore with you. And I I want to continue to examine that, especially as we talk about strategies. 
Oh, because... sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> no, you know how no, passionate well, I get. <laughs> No, but I, th I think it's really important, especially from the standpoint, whether it's formal power dynamic or informal power dynamic, mm -hmm. because I think that that is something that is often missed in this body of work. And right, like I own that as a gap that I constantly have to be paying attention to, to go, well, this is what I have learned and know works for me and or who that works um, when you're part of the dominant culture, right? A lot of the books that have been written about how do you navigate difficult conversations? How do you have conflict? When I think about advice that I've been given has largely been from um, white men who are in power. And that's a different, there's a different privilege. There's a different, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a, there's a privilege I have in situations. There's a privilege I don't have in some situations and there's a different calculation in risk, right? You know, you're speaking to that courage. And so that's something that um, I want us to continue to examine in our conversation of just, because I think that, one, there's, well, and you, you push back on me, right? So, um, but something that I've been wrestling with is how, how do we, how do we explore and speak to some of those nuances? How, how do we, um, you know, in our work with leaders and you, you are working with people in leadership, like how do we become aware ourselves and also help others become aware of that? What might not feel risky to you is actually a significant risk to them. You know, it's something as simple as something as simple as, um, you know, uh, we, we, we want a culture of feedback. We want feedback to go two ways. And it's like, well, feedback from a team member to a manager always carries a very different risk than the mm -hmm. other way around. And, and unless we're aware of that, and unless we're prepared for that and paying attention to that, right, it's so easy. See, I've already decided our next episode, <laughs> just so you know, I'm naming it and I'm putting it out in the universe, is talking about retaliation in the workplace. And, and so... Um, so I just, sorry, I just, my brain went there for a second. I just wanted to, to name that. Um, and now I've lost my train of thought, but I just, I want it to one, like acknowledge and thank you for bringing up that power dynamic. And that is something that is really important. And it's something that, that sometimes is a blind spot for me that I have to be aware of, of like, if I'm predominantly working with like senior leaders means I'm predominantly working with white men. And that dynamic is very different in navigating conflict um, when you're not the person in formal or informal uh, authority and power. Yeah. So to, so to answer your question, if, if I can just kind of reconnect, you said you lost your train of thought, but I don't think you did. Yeah. I just think that you were evolving uh, your, your thought process there. How do, how do we Thank handle you. that? Um, I, I think how we best handle that. So you've heard the, the old saying, right? The best time to plant a tree, right? Was yesterday. Mm right? Mm. The second best mm. time is today. The best time to plan for conflict was yesterday, before oh, when yeah. there was no conflict, mm. right? Um, the second best time to plan for conflict is as soon as you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the absolute, because here's the thing, the reason why conflict is so challenging for people is because most of the time they're building the parachute while the plane is on fire. Mm. Mm -hmm. The plane being the proverbial relationship in whatever context, yeah. it is now on fire. Okay. If your ass is on fire, you're not thinking <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I said ah. Oh, no, you're good. And then you're I repeated good. what this I is... said. Oh, edit that out, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> but did you see my point? Like, can you imagine totally. if the plane is going down and then you hear someone over the loudspeaker like, oh, shoot, we really should figure out what we should do with the plane crashes. Like, you're going to freak out even more. Right? <laughs> right. It's it's such a it's such an apt analogy. It's such a great metaphor, because like in our work, we'll often say like we we in the workplace, we focus so much on the task that we don't spend enough time on the togetherness. And then we don't we don't tend to the relationship until there's a problem. And by then it can be too late. And it's exactly like the point you're making. It's way too late then. Have you so I love on your an airplane. Anal analogy is great. But if you get on an airplane, right? Imagine yeah. as much as you zone out, you're texting, make, putting those last texts in before the plane takes off. In the back of your head, there's something kind of comforting 
that there's this person droning on in the event of an emergency, air will drop down, mm-hmm. put it over your mouth, right? You know, you, you, you kind of, if you've flown a, a few times, you kind of know it to the point where worst case scenario, you may not be able to do it as good as, as the, mm. uh, air, the flight attendant, but you could kind of, you know, get your way through it. Imagine how you would feel if you got on an airplane, you got in your seat <laughs> and the captains came on and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to take off. We're going to ascend to a, a height of about 30,000 feet. It should be a flight time of about two hours and 45 minutes. Uh, so just sit back, relax and enjoy your flight. Thank you for flying with us. And then he hangs up and then they close the doors and they're like, okay, we're off. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. Shouldn't we be saying something here? Should there be some kind of, not that you want it. No one wants the plane to crash, but dag it, we should have a strategy if it does. Should we not? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now, if you don't need it, you get off the plane, you get your carry on, you hope that your gate's not, you know, behind God's back somewhere and you truck it to the baggage claim (laughs) and you go along your business, never thinking about it again. But hot doggone it, Mm. if you need it, you do not want to be on the plane where you were like, oh, man, they didn't go over it. What what do I do? Do I blow into Mm. this? This Mm. this thing's not inflating. What do I do? Mm. And that's how (laughs) we usually handle conflict, right? Yeah. (laughs) You know, there's there's a chance it might happen. What's your plan for it? Oh, no. How effective is that? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I um, I love I. I love all of your metaphors. I love the, <laughs> like, this is such a gift. <laughs> Although I'm not sure how I feel about talking about plane crashing when I have so many flights coming up, but that's, I'll work through my own anxiety with that. But what we're talking but... <laughs> about is, is you, you're going to listen to the flight attendants now with a new level of appreciation. I totally right? am. I'm going to, yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Our guest this week has been T. Maxine Woods McMillan. And our conversation was so in-depth that we've decided to extend this into two parts. So be sure to check us out next week for part two of our conversation exploring conflict and mediation. As always, we want to hear from you what resonated with you, uh, what came up for you, what became clearer for you. Uh, Maybe you've interrogated your system of how you navigate conflict and learn something. You can send us a message at podcast at sarahnullwilson.com. You can also find me on social media where my DMs are always open. And if you'd like to find out more about our work and how we can help your team have conversations that matter, be sure to check us out at sarahnullwilson.com. You can also pick up a copy of my latest book, Don't Feed the Elephants, wherever books are sold. And if you'd like to support the show, which we greatly appreciate, please consider becoming a patron. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations, where your financial support will support and sustain this team that makes this podcast possible, and you'll get access to some pretty great swag. And if you haven't already, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. This helps us be able to increase our exposure so we can continue to bring on amazing guests like T. Maxine Woods McMillan. A big thank you to the team that makes this show possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, to our sound editor, Drew Knoll, to our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Kaylin Summit Nelson, and the rest of the Snowco crew. And just a big wholehearted thank you to Attorney Maxine. Mm. Just bringing lots of new perspectives and language and gifts for us to think about our relationship with conflict differently. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you all so much for listening near and far. And remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves or others, we can change the world. So, Please, my friends, make sure you rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again next week.